important. I'm going to give you one verse, and because of that, I'm just going to let you stay seated while I read it to you, and uh, we'll walk through this. What a crazy week, huh? Has it been a crazy week? How many in the military in here? Wave your hand. You've been in the military. Amen. You know, we, we've honored you guys at Veterans Day, Memorial Day. But what's going on in Afghanistan right now is an absolute travesty. And I don't care what side you're on. It's a travesty. Uh, there's so, I, I am a, 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 a Marcus Luttrell fan. I don't know if you know who Marcus is. But if you've ever seen the show, long, yes, not, it's not, that's not him. Uh, Marcus was a lone survivor. Yeah, he's the one that survived. And, uh, and if you've ever, you, I, I let the girls here last night listen to a, a call from Marcus. You know, he lives here in Texas, and he survived a tremendous firefight in Afghanistan that took out three of his, his Navy SEAL friends. But Marcus, somebody shot his dog, and he chased him all the way up through Point Blank and on Alaska. And there's a recording. All you have to do is look. Don't look it up while I'm preaching. But I, all I had to do was look up Marcus Luttrell, who shot my, he, they shot my dog. And it's the recording of the 911. And he's chasing them. And I'm thinking to myself, if you knew whose dog you just shot. And he's telling the, like, Kenny, he's telling them on the radio. He said, I got two 9 millimeter Bar Berettas sitting right here. And now the woman getting nervous. And they're running 110 mile an hour. And it's Marcus Luttrell. So you, you don't want to do that to that man's dog. And he catches them as a little bit of colorful language at the end. But, uh. You know, and I, I, I'm, I'm sure if you shot my dog, I'd do the same. Amen. So it's just how we think here. It's, it's our mentality. It's ideology. Same thing in Afghanistan. The Taliban has a different ideology. It's not changed in thousands of years. And that is that they are the only ones, and anybody that doesn't uh, hang out under Sharia, Sharia law, amen, deserves execution, death, or punishment. And that's a heartbreak for the women that are there. Amen. And, and to tell, I'm just going to say this to you. And to shut down one of our Air Force bases when you could have got people out already? And then send them to, a, listen, if, if Afghanistan is as big as Texas, and you tell folk in El Paso, get to Houston, we'll fly you out of Bush. Can you imagine the traffic and how hard it would be here? And then when you get here, you got to go through our enemy, and our enemy's going to escort you in, and you're going to call out your name in front of them and say, I got my papers, and if you don't get in, now you're stuck in, this, in Afghanistan, and they know who you are? Do you see the, the terror? And the human carnage, the, the, the uh, Christians that are there, those that have turned to Christ over the last 20 years, amen, because of the freedom that the Americans were given? Are you, are you catching this? Or do we, are we concerned? I am. I'm very concerned. So I'm going to read you a scripture. Amen. John chapter 8, verse 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Say it one more time, Pastor. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Truth, truth is a truth is not just information. What we're receiving right now for the last two years is information, information, information. But just because you've heard information doesn't mean it's truth. Amen. You've got to discover truth. You've got to look for truth. And so we're getting pumped inf information over and over and over again. Now, uh, I posted something that seemed offensive to some in, in some ways. But if you didn't know me, it would, it would have come across that way. But I've asked God to increase my faith. And you'll see me when I post stuff like that. I'll say our faith. My faith needs to be strengthened. Amen. And all that we go through, Jesus told Peter that Satan was after his faith. He wasn't after his friends. He wasn't after his finances. He wasn't after his family. He's after his faith. Your faith is what you hold on to. I have this faith, and I believe that when I preach Clay's funeral, that I will see Clay again. And even though he was cremated, God will take every molecule of him and put it back together again and create a man that I will recognize when I get to heaven. I know that as a truth. Amen. And I believe that truth by faith. Amen? So faith is very, very important to me for me to have. Now, I am hearing over and over again, we have a lady in our church in our North Campus who served, I don't know, 15, 20 years at one employment place. They told her if she took the shot, she'd no longer have to wear a mask. She took the shot so she wouldn't have to wear a mask. That was their carrot to get her to do it. And then two weeks later, they told her, if you don't wear a mask, uh, we're going to fire you. So she quit. 
We have another lady going through that. I had a nurse call me this week from Mississippi. Hey, man, she's crying. She said, Pastor, she's an old friend of mine. She said, Pastor, I'm a nurse here. Oh, almost everyone in this hospital that has COVID have had the vaccination. Now, you're not hearing this on your TV, but I've already heard this from several nurses at different hospitals. She said they've had, and she said, I know that, that uh, one of those shots has something to do with fetus uh, experimentation in order to get it. She said, I want to be pregnant. I want to have a child. I don't want something put in my body that I don't know what it is. And I'm a nurse. I'm a nurse asking questions. Where did the flu go? Where did pneumonia go? Why is everything COVID right now? So I'm searching for the truth. I've talked with those who have had COVID, got the shot, because at first when you got COVID, what was the truth we were hearing? Once you got it, you won't get it again. And then they said, no, well, we're going to give you a shot. You notice I don't call it vaccine. I've got vaccines. Uh -huh. My vac I, got, I have proof of vaccines. Amen. And I've never had what the vaccine gave, uh, put in me. I've never had it again. But now you get one shot, two shot, three shot. They have to three shots with it, so it's a flu shot. Amen. That they're giving you. In order, and, and the way they said, well, if I got the shot, it, it will uh, prevent me from being as sick. You do not know any time whether preventive uh, medicine is going to help you. I take a lot of preventive medicine. I don't know if it's helped me or not. Amen. I'm still getting bigger. <laughs> okay. So, so I have to watch my weight. I have to watch my exercise. But I want to know the truth. And when I hear statements like, unless you've had the shot and got a vaccination card, you can't eat at this restaurant. You can't go to this football game. You can't attend our schools. Now, now you walk in on my freedom. I'm starting to feel a little Merle Haggard come out in me. Amen. Uh, you're walking on the fighting side of me now because I believe in public safety, but as long as it doesn't infringe on my public freedom. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, not bondage. Amen. So I want to be a kingdom man. I want to stay with the word of God, and I don't want to become a victim. And so what's happened is we've become a nation of victims, and this has caused splits in our churches. Mass, no mass, vac, no vac. It shouldn't be that way. I love you. I love this house. I love the people here. I want you well. I'm going to pray over you. Amen. I, I don't care. You know, I've, I've laid hands on more uh, uh, COVID, pneumonia, flu people this, over the last year and a half than I have my whole ministry. I won't quit. Amen. And if that scares you, don't shake my hand. I won't be offended. Just knuckle me, elbow me, amen, wait from a distance, watch me on TV, either way, I, I, I'm just going to stay who I am, because if I ask this congregation right now, how many of you have, had the, uh, have, have been told you've had COVID, more than half of you would lift your hand, just kind of nod your head at me if you know I'm telling the truth, I don't want you to, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've already heard it, man, over and over, and, and the pastor, have you had it, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I don't go test, get tested for stuff. Amen. Why do I want to do that? Amen. If I'm sick, I stay home. Amen. If I'm well, I'll be here. And I got to be real sick to stay home. Because there's an anointing about this pulpit that I've been sick right there. And by the time I get right here, hallelujah, Come on. I'm well again. Amen. Amen. I don't know what else. I, I can't explain it. I can't explain it. But I can tell you it's happened for 28 years of pastoring. Every time I walk by the pulpit, I get well. I just don't want to quit preaching. I just start preaching. I go, boy, I feel good. I keep right on going. Then I run over. Then I get to the next church. I run over. I just want to keep going. Just I don't want to quit. Amen. Because there's something about it. But you got to know the truth. Everybody say the truth. And, and, and if you had a shot, God bless you. you got, and I don't mean this derogatory. I don't have the faith for it yet. But when my faith is strong enough, I don't mind taking it. I'm not against it. Amen. I'm against them taking your freedom and making you do something you don't want to do. Amen. If that puts me driving instead of flying, if that puts me watching football on TV instead of going to the games, look, I can cook. My wife can cook at home. I almost said I can cook at home. But my wife can cook at home. Hey, I can grill out. Hello. Come on, Jesus. Amen. But we all face choices, and we can become victims in our thinking by taking on this mentality. And, you know, we can live in misery of defeat and shame, or, or we can break free and say, say, you know, and this whole message is not about the virus, it's not about Afghanistan, but it's about being the victim. And I, so I, I used this phrase before, uh, run, jump, repeat. This seems like my life. Run, jump, and repeat. Amen. I'm running, man. I'm flowing. I'm going. The church is rocking. And then all of a sudden, we hit a barrier where something happens. There's confusion. And we need truth. Everybody say truth. Yeah. 
And when I know the truth, it has set me free. It gives me freedom. It helps me keep on going. So I run, I jump, then I repeat. Amen. I'm going to run, I'm going to jump, then I'm going to repeat. Amen. And this seems to be the life of every believer I know. Psalm 146, 7 says, God who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, the Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. Now, I'm going to read that to you again, and I'm going to tell you what it means. Amen. The Lord opens the eyes. Go back. Amen. Who executes justice for the op oppressed. God, I need justice. Who gives food to the hungry. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. When I read this psalm out of 146, it hits me that God will not allow us to play the victim. He said, I'm not going to allow you to run around here and act like you're hungry and you're blind and you got injustice. I'm not going to let you do it because I'm going to square up all of that. Can I get an amen? Amen. I'm going to take care of all that. So I'm not going to let you play the victim in life. The Lord gives freedom from our past. And as believers, we have no business investing in a victim mentality because God has delivered us from it. If I am a victim, then I'm always looking at a reason why I'm down. I'm always looking for a reason why things ain't going my way. What happens is we begin to focus on the past. You become to concern yourself with how things should have been. Amen. You get preoccupied with problems. You're always blaming someone else for the way you are. You find yourself helpless you feel you have no control over anything amen you feel like a pawn in the game of life you use expressions like if only or what if amen and you feel like you're always being picked on you know, I was picked on when I was in school. I was picked on because I wore hand-me-down clothes some of y'all wore brand names like Levi's and Wranglers my my brand name was hand-me-down Amen. And I would wear them, and I, I loved them because it was something that I didn't have before. And I got Randy Lindsay's clothes, and Randy was a, a special needs young man that lived down the road on Flatwoods Road, and I would get his clothes, only child. And when he outgrew them, I got them. And I was so proud to wear them, man. And I would go into P.E. I was in the seventh grade, and I had on one of Randy's shirts, but I'd been picked on and picked on and picked on. A, a guy named Danny picked on me, picked on everybody in the school, but he found I was an easy target. And one day in basketball, amen, he shoved me from behind, and I was wearing one of Randy's hand-me-down shirts. And when he shoved me, I hit the ground, the shirt tore, and I lost all mind of where I was. I jumped up and punched him. He hit the ground. My daddy said, if you ever get anybody down, don't let them back up. I straddled him, and I started smacking him upside the head. They pulled me off. Danny got scared. Amen. He was in, this is what happened. After I whooped him, every girl in school whooped him. Because if Jerry could whoop you, anybody could whoop you. What happened was I stopped that victim mentality that I once had and realized that I was stronger than I ever thought I, I was and that those clothes that Randy gave me meant something to me. Amen. Amen. It's very important. As you can see, a person who's consumed with anything that I just mentioned above, amen, or they have these symptoms, would have a hard time walking in any sense of victory. A victim's mentality does not bring victory. If you maintain a victim's mentality, you're going to remain a victim. And God has something better. God, you know, God has something better in this life, and he got something better in the next life. Amen. We live in a mixed up, messed up, falling down world. Amen. And it's getting more mixed up, messed up, and falling down. Amen. And we're looking for a better place. Can I get an amen? But before we get there, we were promised an abundant life here. Amen. And that abundant life has to, two things. It has to be knowing the truth and being set free. Amen. And by the way, let me just be honest with you. This whole thing about, uh, and I posted a scripture out of Revelation 17. It says you can't buy or sell unless you got the mark. I do not believe the vaccine is a mark. Uh, the shot is a mark. I don't believe that. But I do believe that the more we listen and the more the government begins to say, I know how to take, make you healthy, when it does happen, and it will happen, there is a mark coming. There is an antichrist coming. There is a beast coming. There is an end of the age coming. There is an apocalypse coming. Amen. All these things are coming. I don't know the when. I don't know what. You know, we're here. We're not going to be here. Pastor, are you pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-tribulation? Which trib are you? I, I am, I am uh, uh, prepare. Come on. I'm preparing. I say I prepare for pre, and I'm pre uh, uh, prepare. Yeah, and, I, and I'm praying for the, well, I forgot how I used to say it. Yeah, I'm hoping for pre and preparing for post. Amen. I'm hoping to get out of here before it happens. But if it don't, amen. Uh, it, listen, don't tell any people over in Afghanistan who are believers right now that there is no persecution. 
Don't tell them that. And not just there, but other countries. Amen. We're a blessed people. This house ought to be packed. Amen. The TV ought to be streaming all the time. Amen. For people searching for the truth. Amen. Hunting for the truth. So we need the truth of God's word. It, be, it will set us free. It's the only thing that I know, and this is why when I do see things, I line it up with the word of God and the things I understand about the word of God. Amen. It, to break free from the bondages of the past, the principles. Amen. So what I do, Pastor, well, first off, I'm going to keep on running. I'm going to keep on running my race, running my race, running my race. And when I hit a barrier, I got to jump it. I got to get over it. The truth is going to help me get over it. It's going to help me grow. Well, here's the things that people will say. And they'll say in their lives, uh, the reason why they don't grow. First, I'm comfortable. A hard thing about being an American is our comfortability. We love comfort. Shoo, I walked in here this morning at AC, what, working in the back. Looked over at David. I said, man, AC, what, you know what it has to do with? Comfort. All about comfort. I mean, we love comfort. So we get comfortable. Amen. We get comfortable in our nice homes. We get comfortable in our nice vehicles. Amen. Everything about life. And staying in the comfort zone is easier and less stressful than exerting effort to make needed changes. But listen, if nothing changes, nothing changes. So if I want to see change, amen, somewhere in my life, then something got to change. If spiritually, if I want something to change, I got to get back in this book. I got to start reading this Bible again. I got to start praying. I got to start believing. I got to start witnessing. I want to see, if I want my health to change, I got to watch what my intake is. My intake is going to mean everything about how this body is going to respond to stuff. So I got to watch. I got to exercise. I don't like exercising. I don't like exercise. I heard one girl tell me, she said, I hate exercising, but I'll vacuum the floor. Because when I'm vacuuming, I'm sweating, you know, but, and I feel like I'm, I'm doing something, for, you know, other than being running around on a treadmill. They don't understand that. But the bottom line is, if I won't see change in my life, I've got to do something. Can I get amen? If I want my wealth to change, I've got to do something. I can't just sit home and expect the government to send your tax money, my tax money to everybody. Mm, don't say it, Jesus. Mm, amen. Uh, yeah, so, so it's very important, you know, the joy, the joy, joy. If I want joy in life, I've got to make it happen. The joy for me of, of, of getting my daughter's stuff to college and walking around that college with her and seeing Jill so proud, so proud of the accomplishments that she's made at Oral Roberts University. And I walk over and her name's on one of the doors. She's a, she works in the office there now as a senior. She's never going to come back here. Amen. She, she's progressing in life. But the joy of that, the joy of seeing my grandkids and my daughter and my son uh, moving on, the, all these joys, the joy actually of seeing Miss Shirley, all these things took place because I decided I didn't want to be comfortable. Amen. That we I made a move to, to make all this stuff happen in one week and made a plan. You, you plan, you work, and you work your plan. Say it with me. You plan, you work, and you work your plan. Please have a plan. Amen. If you got a plan, then you can work it. A lot of folks go through life. I ain't got no idea what I'm doing here, how I got here. Amen. Don't do that. you got to have a plan. Once you get a plan and you work your plan, I didn't know how I would end up in Chillicothe, Missouri on a Friday, amen, last week. But I had to work, get a plan. Once I got a plan, initiated the plan, boom, it didn't happen. That was uncomfortable at times. Man, I rode through a rainstorm. I couldn't see from here to Marie. Amen. Couldn't see nothing. Could we, Robert? Couldn't see a cotton picking thing. I was following Robert's taillights. Amen. When you get like that, then you, you know there's a lot of rain coming down, man. Amen. Please don't hit them too fast. Hey, hallelujah. Second thing, people do say, well, I'm afraid of failure, Pastor. Fear of making a mistake or risking possible failure discourages trying anything new or different. The Little Country Church was started with a risk. This was risky for us to start this church. It was risky for us to come over here and start another church. Amen. All these things were risks. But if we're going to see something change in life, uh, refurbishing Camp Holy Wild. We, when we started the camp out there, there wasn't nobody going to that camp. No, very few people even knew the camp still existed. Amen. We had to start refurbishing and growing. And now we are a very successful camp every summer that brings in a stream of income into our churches that we normally would not have. And we can help people and employ people that we never could employ before. Amen. That's a good thing. Can I get an amen? Amen. Well, but, Pastor, disapproval hurts. The desire to avoid disapproval, either by themselves or others, limits many to behavior that is calculated to please. You just want to please everybody because you don't want to disapprove. You don't want to say something that's going to hurt somebody's feelings. Can I tell you how to fail in life? Try to, try to please everybody. Amen. You try to please everybody, you're going to fail. So quit worrying about that one. Well, Pastor, I don't want to rock the boat. I got a great one for you. Then get out. Amen. Do like Peter. If you don't want to rock the boat, walk on water, man. Get out of the boat. I, well, I don't have what it takes. That, that's a false sense of inferiority. We can do all things through Christ 
who strengthens us. When I listened to Marcus Luttrell, I'm telling you this, he was giving his story to a football team. And I'm watching this, and I'm thinking to myself, that he shared his story. But then all of a sudden, it hit me, he's sharing this to a football team. Amen. He's letting them know you can do all things. If you decide through Christ, you can do it. Amen. But you've got to understand the Word of God will set you free. If you know the truth, the truth says I can. Amen. So I can't walk around with an attitude of I don't have what it takes. Well, past success may not be good for me. Fear of success will prevent you from leaving your present. There ain't nothing wrong with you being successful. Don't beat yourself up because you. I, I was with some uh, ladies at this uh, funeral, and both of them said to me, and they use this word, we're entrepreneurs. I don't hear that a lot from people. I said, what do you mean? Both of them had multiple businesses they were running. One, two, three businesses. Full of confidence, making business happen. There's nothing wrong with being successful. Amen. Nothing wrong with it at all. Well, Pastor, what if God doesn't want me to succeed? God wants a jackass to succeed. Hello. Amen. I'm sorry. I know there's people in here named Jack, and I probably hurt your feelings. I've got to watch the language I use. Sorry, Jack. God wants us all to succeed. Can I get an amen? Yeah, hold on. He is your father. You are his child. What father doesn't want his child to succeed? Amen. What daddy doesn't want to see his kids do well? But listen, I, I've been waiting and watching. And when I, when I got to Colorado and I saw my son coaching and desiring to coach, he could have been with me. But he said, no, dad, I got to go to coach. I got to go coach this team. Then he, on Friday, I talked to him. He, he said, dad, my, my, my defense, that's what he calls it. My defense did well. When I heard that, look, I've seen failures in life with all five of my kids at one time. But to watch them succeed, to have Katie walk in yesterday, Pastor, I got a new car. He wants to smile upon her. I heard she changed a flat while in Utah. You Listen, if you ain't taught your kids how to change a flat, help yourself. I'm a proud pop. Amen. Because my kids are succeeding. When your kids succeed, you know what happens when your kids don't. You don't say nothing. But when they're doing good, you can't help yourself. You got to say something about it. And your father wants to see you succeed. Amen. He wants to see you be a, not a victim. Amen. Listen to me. How do I do it, Pastor? When, I run, when I'm running and I hit that, that, that hurdle, when I hit that, that, that speed bump, what do I do? First, face the pain and deal with it. Everybody's going to go through pain. Everybody's going to have struggles. you got to be willing to take a good hard look at, at our lives and discern how much of a victim we have become, and then we are willing to see what it was that caused us to fall into this snare. Then we must begin to deal with it by making straight paths for our feet. Listen to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. You strengthen them. You know, one reason I, I, ha I work out some is to try to strengthen my arms. And, and, Robert, I don't think I could have made a lot of that ride without having to work out over the last year and a half because it, it gave me shoulders that used to be in pain, amen, and, and legs that used to be in pain. So I, I, I'm able to do something a little bit more. So he says, strengthen the hands that hang down and the feeble knees. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated. Hold on. You make straight paths. Don't choose the crooked. Choose the straight. So that you won't be dislocated. If you've ever turned an ankle walking on a rocky cliff, amen, that's your fault. You know what I'm looking for? You watch me walk. I'm looking for something straight and easy all the time. Amen. Because I've been dislocated a few times. I've been there a few times. So he said, when, you, when you're walking, find the straight, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all men. Ooh, that's a tough one. And holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Look in diligently, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many will be defiled. One of the passions in my life is to see people deal with bitterness properly. Because we're all going to taste a little bitterness, but it doesn't mean you have to swallow it. It doesn't mean it has to consume you. It doesn't mean you have to barf it on anyone else. Because that's what you will do with bitterness. You will barf it. Amen. You will throw up with someone. That's what bitterness does to us. And bitterness is something you've got to watch out for. Amen. It will defile you. It will hurt you. So in the process of looking at our world and pain, amen, and our wounds, we may come to the conclusion that we have some major forgiveness. Because forgiveness is going to take away the bitterness and the resentments out of our life. This has to be dealt with before the bondage can be broken. This is the first part of the process because we can't begin to walk in the Lord's forgiveness and victory until we have really forgiven those who have caused so much pain, agony, and conflict. 
People say, Pastor, you talk about uh, forgiving a lot. You know why? Because I keep getting new people in church. The older folk been here a long time. Y'all ought to have already done it. But a lot of times, new folk come to church, and they realize they're still holding on forgiveness, and they got to let that go because it will cause bitterness in their life, and it'll be like a cancer. Amen. But it'll be worse than a cancer. It'll be like a virus you can catch because people get around you, and they pick it up. Just what you're going through. Your kids will pick it up, and they'll carry it on after you're dead. And you, you'll be dead and gone, and your kids are still bitter about something you're bitter about. Hey, Amen. You don't know why. Why is mama bitter because grandma's bitter? Why is grandma bitter because great grandma's bitter? Why, why is great why is great because great great grandma got hurt? Well, how'd she get hurt? Well, somebody stole her her um her chamber pot and and she got mad about it. I almost said something else that we used to say in the country. I had to reach way back into the English to pull up something on that one. Hey, Amen. I'm only allowed one bad word per sermon, so I'm sorry, guys. I had to go. He kept, so, and, and, and the hurt just kept going on and on and on. The bitterness kept working. Victims refused to release. Mark eleven twenty five. 25. Why would Jesus say, say this? That whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them. Right. That your Father in heaven may also forgive you and your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I, I used to go through places in Alabama where they said, no trespassing. Amen. Them signs are there for a reason. I cut across the field one time and said, no trespassing. I learned a great lesson about Brahma bulls. Here's the great lesson about Brahma bulls. You can't outrun them. Right. And if you can, the barbed wire is going to hurt. Amen. No trespass. Don't, don't, don't go there. But what you have, understand forgiveness. Once I have been cleared up the bitterness and the resentment, I got to focus on the solution and quit investing. Amen. And focusing on the problem. The problem with most folk is that they spend all their energy focusing on that problem, and then there's a little bit of energy for the solution. Amen. So don't allow the perpetrator to live rent-free in your head. Don't allow it to happen. Second, take responsibility for your life. In order to maximize your load, you have to minimize your load. Let me say it again. In order to maximize your life, you got to minimize your load. Some of you take on way too many responsibilities and problems of other people. What's that? Is that none of your business? Amen. Not, you don't have to take on everybody's problem. Hallelujah. If you do, you're going to be overloaded. Amen. They always, you know, overloaded people fail. Overloaded people fail. How do you know that, Pastor? Because I have failed. And I've been overloaded. That's why I never use the term I'm busy. I won't use it. I'm extremely effective, but I'm not busy. I don't use safety. I'm secure. That's why I'm always laughing at people, amen, when they tell me that. And I, I don't mean to be a crass or mean. I just want to stay Bible. Can I get an amen? Amen. So they always have, always have, always will. They fail. They fail because they're overloaded. They fail in marriage. They fail in ministry. They fail in management. They fail at parenting and partnership and professional endeavors. And like an airplane, we can only carry so much Amen. The plane can. Too much baggage, it can't fly. And most of us end up exceeding the weight limit, motivated by desire to please. We just want to please. We just want to do. We get those phone calls. We try to please. We try to impress. Amen. And otherwise, we gain, we gain commendations. We take on too much. And in the end, we fail to reach the heights of success or else we crash because we ignore our limitations. It's my responsibility. No matter who or what may have caused you to fall into a victim mentality, it's your responsibility to get out of it. Some people ain't going to help you out. Some folk tired of trying to help you out. You've got to decide, I'm going to come out of this. The enemy wants you to react. Jesus wants you to respond. Amen. That's what Jesus, take deliberate action, amen, for healing and forgiveness. You know, the prodigal son's testimony, everybody understands the prodigal, amen, the young man that left home, took his father's, uh, uh, his riches, his inheritance, and the prodigal son is an example of a person who fell into the trap of a victim. But his victory was predicated on the fact that he took responsibility full for his actions. He didn't accept the fact that he was the victim. He decided, you know what? My father's flunky's fair, far finer. I think I'll go back home. And he gets up. He, was, he found himself a Jewish man in a pig pen. But you understand, that's not kosher. Amen. In a pig pen, uh, dealing with the husk, trying to find something to eat. And he gets up and he goes home. And I love the response to the father. That's why I'm telling you about daddy. <sighs> The love of a parent, whether mother or father, a guardian, adopted parent, the love you have for children and the love your children have for you, it bonds you. And even though they have been in the pig pen 
and squandered this stuff. And the elderly brother said he'd been with prostitutes. And, and said so he comes back home. The father had fattened up a calf. Every morning, daddy got up and went outside with his, with his sack of feed. Amen. And he, and he threw some feed in on that little calf. Tears flowing down his face. His elder brother knowing that daddy's hurt because his son has left him. His son is no longer here. He gave him his inheritance. And he, he threw some feet in there. And when tears come down his face, a word of the Lord comes to him, feed that calf a little more. So he throws a little extra feet in there on that calf. And he walks away. And the next morning he gets up and he goes there. And the word of the Lord comes to him, feed that calf a little bit more. And he throws that calf a little bit more feed. And, and the calf is just getting bigger and bigger. And, he, and somebody said to him, why are you feeding that calf a little extra? And he said, God told me to. I think there's a miracle coming down the road somewhere. I don't know how, but I'm just going to keep right on feeding that calf. Some of you parents, your kids have been prodigal. They've been away from God. Keep feeding the calf. Can I get an amen? Keep believing God for the best. Hallelujah. And he kept throwing it in. And then all of a sudden, here comes that. That boy up the road, he sees him, tears flowing down his face. He runs to meet the little boy, amen, embraces him, puts a ring on his finger, and says to him, you're my child, and whatever's mine, whether my inheritance now or later, it's yours, amen, put a robe on his back. I'm sure they were throwing things at him. The, the town was disgusted with him, but not the father. That's why you got, you got to love a church that loves people and accepts folk when they come in as they are until they get cleaned up. Amen. And then he said, kill the fatted calf. And that calf had done got fatter and fatter and fatter. That calf thought he was on an easy life. Mm -hmm. Y'all know the story about the pig and the chicken walking down the road? There was a banquet going on, and they asked for bacon, and they asked for eggs. And the chicken threw up one of his hands and said, I'll give the eggs. And the pig looked over at him. He said, listen, eggs for you are an offering. Bacon for me is a sacrifice. Can I get an amen? A lot of folk will give an offering. They'll give eggs, but they don't want to give the sacrifice. Amen. Well, that just come out of nowhere. Luke 15 tells us that when he came to himself, when the prodigal son came to himself, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? I perish with hunger. I will arise. We'll take responsibility. I'm going to go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against I'm going to admit I've sinned against heaven, and I've sinned before you. And at that moment, of course, the party took place. See, that's what I believe about heaven. It's going to be a party. Amen. It's going to be an amazing place because your father loves you like that. Amen. He wants to bring you in. i got to start closing up here. woo -hoo. Amen. See, I told you. This is what happens when I'm gone for a week. I feel like I could give you all a double dose. How clearly established goals and priorities. I'm going to walk fast, guys. How clearly, so we've already talked about getting a plan. Proverbs 21, 5, the plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty, but those of everyone who is hasty surely to poverty. We don't take control of our lives by establishing goals and priorities. Circumstances and other things will do it for you. Be kingdom focused, and I'll start closing with this. Be kingdom focused. I must. I must. When I see the world problems, I got to stay focused on the kingdom. When I hear pandemic, uh, pan, pandemics, I got to stay kingdom focused. I got to remind myself, what would Jesus do? I started watching The Chosen last week. In watching it, I saw Jesus heal the leper. And I thought to myself, he touched the leper. We, we for years, walked around with little braces on and said, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus, how would Jesus handle this? This is kingdom-minded stuff. Thinking like the kingdom. Amen. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. If I'm to break free from the past, if I'm to refuse to be a victim, i got to begin to shift my focus on something much more important that will occupy my mind and thoughts. And as we become more kingdom-focused, we'll begin to make the right choices that enact the law. Watch it. I'm sowing and reaping. But as I sow, I'll reap. To bring forth God's blessings and deliverance into my life. So our lives are made up of a series of choices. And if those choices were made according to carnal and selfish desires, we begin to block the flow of God's blessing and abundance in our life. On the other hand, if I'm making right choices that are in relationship to seeking first the kingdom of God, I'm going to release his flow. There'll be a fatted calf prepared. There'll be a ring for my finger and a robe on my back. The law of sowing and reaping, our futures are locked in the seeds to sow. This morning, I forgot to bring an apple. 
I was going to cut an apple in half for you. If you can imagine me holding a half an apple right now, you would see the, the core of the apple. Inside that core, what would you see? A seed. Inside that seed is what? A tree. Inside that tree is what? More apples. You follow where I'm going? Amen. When I sow seed, kingdom-minded, when I do right things for the right reason, amen, whether it be my time, my treasure, my tithe, whatever it is, there's a seed there. And that seed, I plant that seed, I get a tree. With that tree, I get more apples. Can I get an amen? Oh, that's just how it works. Run, jump, repeat. Stand with me if you would. Now, I told you. Now I'm going to tell you what I told you. I'm going to say it again to you. In this life, face the pain and deal with it. Whether you cause it or somebody else caused it, you got to deal with it. Take responsibility for your life. I wish I could tell my athletic kids go exercise for me. I wish I could tell them while I eat this coconut pie bluebell ice cream, <laughs> y'all go eat broccoli and lettuce for me. I mean, don't know where I got to take responsibility for myself. I still got a half of the half a gallon, okay? I've had it for two weeks. Thank God I was gone for eight days. I haven't seen it. <laughs> but now I know it's there, Ken. I'm in trouble. Have clearly established goals and priorities. In the next couple of weeks, we will have Muscle Car Sunday. It will be a goal of ours to reach people. It will be a priority for us to feed people. It will be a, an opportunity for us to gather together. But Hot Rods and Harleys, you know, and, and Hondas. My bad, John. Amen. Uh, I just don't offend people, you see. Okay. It is a Honda, isn't it? Okay, okay. Um, either way, we got priorities ahead. We got to deal with them. Have clearly established goals and priorities. And be kingdom focused. Life is too short to allow yourself to be an inmate in the prison of bad choices and weak decisions. The prison of previous mistakes and a victim's mentality that comes with the jailers of guilt and regret. Don't want those. Don't spend another night in the graveyard of guilt dealing with the corpses of the past run and when you get to it jump then repeat I told you about Marcus Luttrell his back was broke he'd been shot he had shrapnel in him and you might have saw the movie but there was one part you see Mark Wahlberg walking out that didn't happen Marcus said that when the daylight came, the Taliban left, and his friends were killed. He took a rock, Kenny. He said, and I, I drew a line as far as I could reach with the rock. And I crawled until my feet were past that mark. And then I drew another line, and I crawled until my feet were past that mark. I drew another line, and I crawled for seven miles, for seven miles until he was rescued by some Afghan villagers. Seven miles, I drew a line. And sometimes in life, it's hard to run. You'll hit that hurdle. You'll hit that speed bump. But when you do, remind yourself, you can't quit. You don't give up, though the pace seems slow. You might succeed with another blow. Success is failure turned inside out. So stick to the race when your heart is hit. It's when things grow worse that you mustn't quit. Draw a line, and if you have to, and you can't run, and you can't walk, crawl to it until you get past it. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, so your presence is in this house. Your presence is online right now. I sense you're, you're touching hearts. You're telling us no longer can we remain a victim but it's time for us to literally decide for ourselves, I can do all things through you who strengthens me. If this message was talking to you, put your hand up right now. You, you know. Now I want you to take that hand of yours and make a fist, if you would. And I want you to draw a mark in an imaginary place. And imagine yourself pulling yourself toward it. Father, in Jesus' name, release the victims right now. 
We are more than conquerors through you who loves us. Lord, you'll move us into the next place in life. We may hit a speed bump. We may hit a hurdle. But I refuse. We refuse. Say it with me. We refuse to stay the victim. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise in here. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Alabama, thanks for coming today. Brittany, amen. Thanks for being here today. God bless you. You may be seated. David's going to come up.